Good morning, everyone. This is Darius Dell here, Senior Analyst on the Hedge Eye Macro team, uh, to welcome you to another edition of the Hedge Eye Macro Show for Wednesday, November 2nd, 2016. I'm joined in the studio today with Hedge Eye CEO Keith McCullough. Before I turn things over to him for his prepared remarks, allow me to briefly touch on the asset allocation model. Held flat with cash at 51%. U.S. equities, we also held flat at 4%. International equities, we took up to 6% from 4%. Commodities, we nudged down to 9% from 11%. Foreign exchange, we took up to 7% from 6%, and fixed income, we reduced to 23% from 24%. As a percentile of the maximum preferred exposure for each respective asset class, cash is in the 51st percentile, U.S. equities in the 12th percentile, international equities in the 18th percentile, commodities in the 27th percentile, foreign exchange in the 21st percentile, and fixed income in the 70th percentile. As always, if there are any questions, just pop them into the chat stream. We'll try to get to as many as we can before the end of the call. With that, take it away, Keith. Thanks, Darius, and good morning. For those of you that are new to the show, and thank you for signing up, uh, the asset allocation has everything to do with a pivot on a day-over-day -day basis, a pivot on a day-over-day -day basis. So, in other words, because our only big net long position in the commodity asset allocation is gold, gold goes up, so we take the asset allocation down in as much as when gold was going down, we took it up. You can see that day-over-day, -day, you can see it week-over-week, after super huge moves in bonds, we took the asset allocation of bonds all the way down, I believe in June and July of this year, and then we took it right back up and tend to take it back up when the 10-year bond yield hits the top end of the risk range, by which it's already fallen seven basis points from the top end of that range only a couple days ago, or actually maybe even 24 hours ago. So that's how we do it. We like to buy low, sell high, rinse and repeat. Top three things this morning in the notebook. Number one, I'm gonna talk about stocks. You know, Darius and I heard a guy in Boston one time when Darius first started working with me. How do you say it? He said, that was a while ago. He's like, I don't wanna talk about macro. What do I wanna talk about? Stocks. Yeah, stocks. Yeah, I talk stocks. Yeah, so what do you want to talk about stocks? Uh, shortly thereafter, this, uh, this gentleman retired from the old wall. Stocks, number one. Number two, gold. Number three, bonds. You'll, you'll note that I'm not a stockbroker. You know, again, we do global macro. And again, there's stocks that are global. And that's what I mean by stocks. Of course, if you're along the S&P 500, uh, you're up 0.36% uh, versus this day last year, uh, which is not a really good return given the drawdown you had to uh, deal with in between really November, December of last year and the February low. But notwithstanding that, you're up about 0%. Uh, but if you're up something like European equities or stocks, uh, the Euro stocks 50 would be something like the Dow bro. Uh, you're down about 13%. If you're uh, long, God forbid, uh, you're long Spanish stocks, you're down about 14%. If you're long Spanish stocks, maybe cue that chart, uh, Josephine, uh, from last year's global equity stock market high, global equity being the two words that most people on Manic Media TV don't talk about, uh, you're down about 25% from the global equity bubble high. Don't forget the global equity bubble high includes global equities. Okay, so again, that's the point, uh, global equities. And that's, and that's really why we've kept you out of trouble this year, whether it be Japanese equities, Chinese equities. Uh, look at the Hang Seng, for example, this morning, uh, down on another one and a half percent. The trend is not your friend there if you're bullish on the Hang Seng from the global equity bubble market high. Yes, the global equity bubble market high. This should be part of your vernacular, uh, given that it's not part of the folks and their vernacular. Eh, you ever notice how many people call you a folk? I'm not a folk, I'm just a guy. Gold, number two is not a stock, it's currency. But you can put it in the commodity bucket and cheat a little bit on asset allocation. So let's do that. Uh, look at gold. Well, look at what this thing's been doing. You had three different times, and we tend to get a lot of questions, and again, uh, impatient maybe new subscribers, uh, and rightly so, when we're wrong on anything for a day, never mind half a day or, or a month, uh, we'll get a lot of complaints and questions, but that's fair, that's fair game. Uh, I could complain about you and as much as you complain about me, but that's not a really good way to live your life. A really good way to live your life is to seize opportunity when you understand it. Um, so let me like kind of get back into my Joel Olstein uh, sense of self and again, and, and give you the positive message. Give you the positive message. You had three fantastic and beautiful buying opportunities this year in gold. At the beginning of January, you had that, that was a, look at that, look again, split the screen, Josephine. Look at the beautiful gift of God. Look at that, the beginning of January. There is the beginning of June, the beginning of October, yeah. I mean, God doesn't appear in, in many, many places, you know, at all, at all times, Whoa. but he's ever, ever present. Look at the gold, the gold, the gold. You're up 22.5% for the year to date. Gold's up again this morning and signaling overbought. So after these three wonderful, beautiful buying opportunities, you see how good I'd be at being a perma, perma bull uh, stock market operator? Uh, beautiful opportunities. 
you're up again and now you can sell some. To all the poor bastards who sat there and, and sold it to you uh, at $12.50, $12.55, $12.45, $12.36, what, what did they sell you gold at now that they're willing to chase the chart at $1,300? I don't know. I don't care. Sell at the top end of the range. We're right around that right now. The risk range for gold now is currently $12.58 to $1,301 on an immediate term basis. Finally, on bonds. Since we're not going to talk about stocks all the time, we're going to not just talk about gold all the time. That would be cherry picking. Uh, you know, why would you cherry pick something that's up 22.4% year to date when the S&P 500 is barely up three? Um, bonds, however, we've not been sucked into the junk bond rally. Uh, we've told you that if you want to be positioned on junk, you could short them against treasuries, but I didn't really put that on because uh, I was more concerned about the rates trade, which I am on an ongoing basis. Don't forget that this morning's ADP slowdown number is in, you know, again, rate smack in the middle of what you should be seeing at this stage of the late cycle employment data, which is slowing data. Now, we do have some passive aggressive economists out there, like my friend Joe Lasagna, who came out yesterday and said, look, I'm taking down my GDP growth forecast due to election risk. Come on, Joe. <laughs> Come on. Ferrari Joe. <laughs> Ferrari Joe. He says, well, you know, it's due to election risk. You know, I've been wrong all year, so let's just blame the election. <laughs> Ferrari Joe could have blamed China, yep. could have blamed Brexit, could yep. have blamed X Energy. Every there's so many different things you could blame, but they'll always find something to blame on the old wall. Yep. Uh, and notwithstanding Lasagna's problems, the bigger issue uh, for people that are along the junk in the trunk, whether they be small cap or liquid equities, which have been god awful for the last couple of weeks, we've kept you away from that for well over a year now, going back to July of 2015. The Russell 2000, by the way, is down about 9.1% from there. Some people call that a secular bull. Uh, I call that secular bull something. Uh, the reality is that, again, you'd have to be up double digits from here just to get back to break even on small caps. But again, junk. These things don't act well when oil goes down, by the way. There's a lot of energy exposure in the Russell 2000. There's a lot of energy exposure in junk. Uh, I'd much prefer for the rates trade in conjunction with another rate of change slowdown in ADP. You get another rate of change slowdown in the jobs report on Friday. You want to be long treasuries, okay? Long-term treasuries. I haven't been running around telling you to buy Spanish bonds or UK bonds or anything like that. Long-term, long-dong treasuries. So again, and I've shown that in many different ways. And again, last week we gave you a buy signal on zeros, literally at the low of the week for bonds. So bought a bond low, sell some bonds higher. Bought more bonds lower, sell them higher. They're making higher lows throughout this entire cycle. And again, all you've had to get right to be long, the long bond is growth slowing. Those are your top three things. All right, let's get going here. Yep. Uh, after down six consecutive days, uh, the US bull market is shaking. Uh, please don't short the lows today. Uh, we're getting pretty close to the low end of the risk range here. Uh, another half a percent downside. You saw that actually in the futures this morning. I was on uh, the phone with one of our sharper hedge fund clients in California. He was up, it was like 3.30 in the morning for him. Uh, but I told him, I said, look, you gotta cover some here. We're at the low end of the range. That's when the futures were lower this morning. Again, that's how you use the risk range. So at the low end of the range, you buy and cover. Uh, if you have certain favorite shorts that you super duper love and they're doing a lot of good things for you, uh, you cover some, cover some, don't cover all. Uh, and then you short the bounce. How do we get a bounce? Well, you hit the low end of the range. Everybody's too bearish. After six days in a row, I mean, you don't really even need a catalyst. I mean, anything at this point, uh, the bankers are trying to get everyone to buy everyone. There's plenty of catalysts. I mean, we've just had the biggest M&A month in US history and the stock market still can't go up. Uh, but the reality is that this is what you have. You have an immediate term risk range of 2101 to 2135 at the top end. Not a lot of upside, but more upside than downside. 1% upside versus yesterday's close of 2111 versus a half a percent downside. So that's why you saw me covering some shorts in real time alerts yesterday. Uh, volatility's risk range is still not a friend of the bulls. Not a friend of the bulls, not at all. The only volatility signal that is the friend, real friend of the bulls right now is actually gold. And we did make that point clear. I like gold more than I liked treasury bonds. If I had to pick one or, one or the other, I said that multiple times, you can go back and review the tapes. Uh, but the reality is that that's because gold signal from a volatility perspective is tighter. Uh, and again, the re reason why the volatility signal for bonds is wider is because these damn Fed guys want to do a rate hike into a slowdown. I didn't tell them to do that. That's just what you got. So if you don't, you get to what you get, you don't get upset. Uh, but the risk range on, on equities and volatility uh, embedded in equities is quite wide. I mean, the risk range on uh, US equity volatility is now 1501 on VIX to 19 spot 63. You'll note at 18, 19, 20 VIX, most people that are really super duper permeable uh, equity people, they don't really want to buy anything. Nope. You get more buy signals from us than anybody at that level. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Uh, volume yesterday, wild guess, what did it do on a down day? You didn't guess, right, did you? It was up. Double digits. 
versus, and by the way, uh, you know, the stock market's been down for the last month and the one month average is up versus where the markets have been. That's why versus the three month average when the market was up three months ago, it's up 36%. So again, you know, this is a big deal. A lot of volume, a lot of volume. Same San Francisco uh, portfolio manager says to me today, he goes, you know what, Keith? Uh, I was short some L brands yesterday and, and you know what? I had to cover some because it's hard. The li liquidity in the market, you need to take advantage of days like that because it's just, it all comes at once, you know, so he has to trade on days like that. Um, but again, understand that this is a liquidity trap. It really was throughout the summertime. Market keeps going up. Joe Kernan gets sucked in onto the Dow. Everybody's happy, end of October, or end of August, and then all of a sudden, the October surprise. Let's blame the election. Whatever we do, don't blame the economic data or the earnings cycle. Look at this earnings cycle, by the way. Um, the S&P 500, you know, again, and this is non-GAAP, is now 346 companies out of the 500 have reported. I don't know if Josephine can show this. But the year-over-year -year earnings growth is now down to 0.4%. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, it you won't know. be after today. And that's with the financials making up numbers. If the financials weren't making up the numbers down there with loan loss provisions understated, and we did have a follower saying, Keith, you're way over my head with that. I mean, come on. I mean, if we're going to play at this level, we can't. I mean, loan loss provisions, you know what that is. If you don't know what it is, look it up on Wikipedia. We need to teach each other, okay? So again, we all have our... Um, you know, if you're listening to Joel Steen, you got your Bible. If you're listening to us, you got Wikipedia. Okay, so loan loss provisions. You need to know what that is. When fi a financial company, a bank in particular, can basically, and credit card companies, can state any number they want on earnings on a non-GAAP basis, never mind if they just you know, understate their loan loss provisions. So in other words, as the, as the risk, the credit risk of their portfolio is going up, they should be taking loan loss provisions. Most of these companies did not. That's why you don't have currently negative earnings growth. You have 0.4% earnings growth, which versus expectations, uh, again, clearly is bad because obviously you see uh, stocks on the industrial complex and actually the energy complex are going down at a faster rate because they're really not beating quote unquote expectations in terms of the people who own those stocks. Those are the real expect expectations. Uh, sector studies, as you can see, uh, yesterday was a very bad day. Uh, every sector pretty much down. Uh, energy was up modestly, uh, but there's no modesty in being long consumer discretionary this year. Nope, down 78 basis points for the year to date. Healthcare is worse, down 6.9. Just an ugly, ugly situation that continues to develop. Uh, rest of the world, as I pointed out, China was down last night, Hong Kong down 1.5%, Japan down 1.8%. Why is Japan down? I'll give you a wild guess, Cur you know, currency move. So again, you get a yen up move to 103-ish, 103.5 or 103.65, that's a half a percent move. Uh, and the yen up gives you a 1.8% move down. It was a pretty ugly session, broad-based ugly session in Asia, which gave you the low end of the risk range on SPIs or S&P 500 futures if you're trading them. Uh, again, these things tend to come to a crescendo after most people have missed the move. Uh, Denmark, something's wrong in Denmark. That again, uh, leads losers this morning down about 1.5%, down 7% in the last month. I showed you Spain just for kicks and giggles. I'll show it to you again. As a friendly reminder, Stocks can go down. Stocks, yeah, I want to own stocks. stocks. You, want to, you want to own stocks, okay? I mean, if you, you, we don't have that dynamically. One day we will. Because uh, again, Hedgeye is only going to evolve and improve and with more capital, we're going to continue to, uh, M-O-R-E kind, uh, we're going to continue to, again, raise the profile of what it is that we're distributing to every day. So visually, what, I, what I'd like to do is get to a place where Darius can now throw an overlay on what Spanish sovereign bonds have done over the same period of equities. And what you'll note is that bonds, my friends, gentlemen or not, gentlemen prefer bonds when growth is slowing. You can see that, uh, stocks versus bonds. I mean, it's, it's a joke. So the bigger joke is actually that most of Wall Street and old wall media don't even explain it truthfully uh, in, in that regard, which is sad. Uh, finally, uh, just to give you some risk ranges and wrap it up and then take some questions. Uh, risk range on oil, 4601, isn't that the darndest thing that oil stopped going up right at the hedge eye tail risk line of 52 and change. Uh, top end of the risk range there is 48 spot 79. Uh, gold, I already gave you know, one more time, three more times. Beautiful, just beautiful. Beautiful buying opportunities, three of them. Hope you took advantage of all three. Uh, 1301 is the top end of the risk range there. Loan of the risk range, 1258. Uh, risk range on copper, getting a lot of questions on copper because it had, hasn't gone down for a couple days. So we'll tend to get a, questions, a lot more questions when things aren't working, uh, which is fair, uh, totally fair. Everything in life is fair. You get what you get, you don't get upset. 206 to 223. So in other words, if you shorted 223, it's still probable that you get paid out at 206. So don't whine about it, take advantage of it. Uh, risk range, 10-year bond yield, 168. 
to 188 and uh, risk range on the euro 108 to 110 so the euro's overbought the dollar's oversold that's another uh, call that we could have you know just uh, that could have been our only call this morning currency markets are at their extended point in as much as equity markets in general are uh, the dax was oversold over uh, the course of this morning as well so a good spot to uh, take some questions on whatever you want to talk about macro yep. hedge funds i saw some um, i should have called that i'd put it in the early look ahead yeah title in the wall street journal where they no longer have people working at the Wall Street Journal. They're providing you payouts or buyouts. Macro hedge funds outperformed in October as yields rose. Ooh la la. Then if you read one line under, which most people don't read that far, such funds lost money for three of the last four years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got fired by a pretty big uh, prominent uh, macro hedge fund. Yeah, I, 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 I did spell more M-O-R-E, did I not? Yeah, I was uh, say But anyway, you know, the reason why is because when growth was accelerating, they were long bonds in 2013. That, that's, that's why, three to four years ago is a long time. Uh, not in Chicago Cubs speak, but, and I wrote about that this morning as well. I tried to tell you that the time series of the Chicago Cubs, don't forget that they've lost the last seven World Series that they've gone to. It's not just 1908. After 1908, they'd been to seven World Series and lost. Um, if you use the real time series of data, you'll note that four years is really not that long. I mean, imagine you're a Chicago Cubs or a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. Uh, Toronto Maple Leafs won their last uh, Stanley Cup in 1967, and I'm a Toronto Maple Leafs fan suffering uh, from that syndrome, uh, and that's not good. So anyway, that's why uh, I wanted to tell you something else this morning, which is in the last four years, macro hedge funds, some considered to be the smartest people on the planet, and they may be, but dead wrong. 2013, growth accelerates, hedge eye shorts, bonds, and gold, boom. Bond yields go up, everyone's taper tanning, and they're all on the wrong side. Then 2015 cycle peak is in, they're now short bonds, and bonds do nothing but go up for a year and a half. That's why three of the last four years have been awful, and one October surprise does not a trend make. Yeah, for sure. The street, and by and large, has been really offsides on interest rates for quite some time now. Yeah, and <laughs> instead of some of these guys take it really personally, yeah. because I would too. I mean. I probably wouldn't have a firm if I was that wrong. Um, and, and some of them were, um, took it quite personally, called me different names. I'm, um, you know, like they're not, uh, some of them aren't uh, overly confident or anything like that. Um, but they had plenty of personal issues with me. And we won't do business with them, but that's fine because some of them won't have a business. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. Could have helped them a lot. Yeah, for sure. All right, now let's get into the question. Lots to uh, get through here. Very diverse queue. Mike's asking the first question here. says, uh, TD announced this morning that they are raising their mortgage rates 15 basis points, and it is it expected that other Canadian banks follow. Uh, what are your thoughts on this move? Uh, that's interesting. I mean, uh, I guess that could be a capital charge that you try to generate some income from. Um, could happen. You know, the reality is that uh, the Canadian banking system is under a lot of duress from a housing perspective. So we've seen, and, and you can look it up on, on hedgeye.com, just put in Vancouver in the search box and you'll see uh, plenty of data crashing real estate prices uh, at the local level in certain Canadian uh, bubble housing markets where the government has come in and started to regulate foreign buyers. Um, so for them to start to put in you know, higher capital charges on capital, that doesn't surprise me. A lot of these Canadian banks are in a very bad position. Uh, that's why we're short them. Indeed. Next question here from Steve. Says, what key government statistics are reported year over year and which are reported month over month and why the variance? Well, they're uh, all, all government data, as long as the data is in a data series, you as the analyst can put it into quarter over quarter and year over year form. Okay, so that's the first, I mean, it's the most basic part of analysis, but um, all data is, is report, that's reported can be put in a time series. So that's that, the trivial matter. Like you'd be like, yeah, no, no S, Sherlock. Uh, but it is a little non-trivial or greatly, usually non-trivial to consider why the USA, a great country, an evolving, uh, an evolving population that's trying to be on the front lines of, of math and science, why they don't talk about all government data on a year-over-year -year basis. I mean, I don't know. I, uh, I guess I, we should thank God for that. I mean, we're educating people True. with a very basic <laughs> level. Like, it's almost like we're providing the weather daily. I mean, yeah. are we, is that like what we're doing? Like, well, it's like forecasting the weather, which is very difficult and requires a lot of intelligence and a lot of sophisticated tools. Uh, so, 
yes, maybe it's like providing the weather daily, but if you're telling someone what the 10-day forecast is, you, know, you or I can't just do that with, uh, with the tools that we have. So, you know, I like the opportunity. So I, you know, I mean, we've been doing this for eight years, or at least this, in this format. I can't for the life of me. Like, we haven't had one analyst on the buy side or portfolio manager, CIO, say, yeah, that's really thoughtful. You know, I really don't understand why the government reports month over month in sequential reading numbers. Like you can't model a company with, with that stuff. It doesn't make any sense. Well, because it's, perfe uh, it's perfect. It's perfect because it's perfect for government because they can obfuscate pretty much anything. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's sad, but it's mm -hmm. uh, take advantage of it. Don't be upset about it. I mean, this is the this is the land of opportunity. Last I checked, I mean, they're not going to completely make America bad again. Um, but the reality is that you should take advantage of that. I mean, you shouldn't want everyone in the world to understand how you're getting ahead of them on macro asset allocations longs and shorts you shouldn't want that you should you should you should actually want people to remain ignorant for as long as you can make money fact that is a fact all right let's move on here so this is the market sell off really about people thinking that a trump presidency based upon reduced regulation and lower taxes will be worse than a clinton presidency based upon higher regulation and increased taxes not to mention four years of corruption hearings yeah or earnings season or global growth or any economic data for that matter uh Everyone on Wall Street has been trained to be lazy and try to boil it down to one thing. If you look at Bloomberg's headline yesterday, we reviewed this. It was all about global demand accelerating due to China. And then all of a sudden that got turned off to, oh, the, the sell-off is due purely to the election. Purely. Only. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so absurd that people actually are dumb enough to buy into these, these memes and narratives and it's really called a shortcut or Occam's razor. People want a very simple solution for all that ails them. Uh, and this is not simple. Uh, the economy or the ecosystem by which we're trying to generate returns or preserve and protect capital and then grow it is a dynamic ecosystem. It's a dynamic, write it down, a dynamic ecosystem of nonlinear factors. It doesn't get ever get down to one thing, ever, never. I mean, in the intermediate to long term, that's an absurdity, beyond absurdities, to think that way. It's, it's a nice shortcut looking backwards. But if you could look backwards and these people knew what was going on, why six market days ago didn't they tell you that this was going to happen uh, if it was that simple? You know, so again, don't get sucked into that. You're better than that. Absolutely. All right, uh, next question here says, um, if the Fed and other government agencies continue to obfuscate the real data and the truth for political reasons, how do you invest around that? Is, that? is the value of your process to see through that stuff? And thanks for your insight, as always. Yeah, markets don't believe governments, by the way. I, I'm pretty sure you know that. I mean, mo most people, if you really you know, look at the Fed, I mean, people say don't, don't fight the Fed. If all you've done is fade the Fed's forecast for 17 months, you've done nothing but make money. Uh, if you believed in the Fed's obfuscation of the data or their um, incompetent forecasting, you, you would have lost a lot of money. Um, so, you know, just take advantage of it. You can't get too upset about it. I'm kind of well past that point. You're not going to change people and their ideologies in many ways. This is an ideology. I hope you know what that is. Uh, an ideology, a fundamental belief system that will not change. You know, you know how those things change? They don't change on the edge of evolution. They don't change on the edge of uh, something like hedge eye telling you the truth. No, 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 no. Ideologies die. That's the only way they change. They don't just wake up one morning and change their mind saying, oh, these guys, this guy Darius is a really good looking guy and you know, Keith is tolerable and you know, these, people, <laughs> these, pe these people have really changed my view of the world. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Are you serious? No, an ideology, the only way for it to change is for it to literally die on time's vine. Yeah, for sure. And I would add one other thing that's part of our process is, is focusing on second derivatives rather than the first derivatives or absolute figures, which allows us to analyze any data series, whether it be made up or not, um, on a rate of change basis. Yeah. Um, and then we can infer conclusions as to what the financial markets are going to, how they're going to respond from there. Um, I don't, you know, as we say this all the time, you know, you did two apples make two apples, you know, it doesn't matter if the apple's fake or not, or a real apple. <laughs> one, one could have a worm in it, one could be made out of wax, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but they're two apples and we can analyze them from there. All right, next question. Um, uh, the, the asker asked a question during yesterday's macro show. That question, if Q3's GDP number was higher than you expected, 
uh, when that sequentially lower Q4 headline number. Um, he thinks you misunderstood the question and defended the process, but he wasn't intended to knock your process at all. I just wanted to get a better understanding of the data. Yeah, and I, I don't mind if people, cha I mean, I want people to challenge the process. I mean, we challenge you. If you could just have, uh, actually, maybe we'll just keep the camera on one day and um, provided that it's not near the men's room, that would be tolerable as well. <laughs> uh, you could watch that all we do throughout the day is challenge our premise, challenge the process. We don't hire people who, you know, come in and go, <laughs> I believe in and I'm going to accept everything that you say all day long. And that doesn't, that's not how we build it. That's not how we shake it, break it, try to change it, try to evolve it. Um, so we appreciate it when, um, you know, you, should, you don't have to apologize for, um, for asking questions a certain way. I, I, it's very hard to offend me. Um, but if you look at uh, really kind of mapping uh, what you just asked, which is the, the path of sequential GDP, because that's absolutely the question. So again, you have a, a rate of change, this is called a cycle. GDP, as you know, peaked at 3.3% in the middle of, of last year. How many times can I write this down? Actually, it peaked at uh, one cube. Um, and then we, go, we come down here to 1.5% year over year, and now the, the call is, or at least the risk management exercise is trying to map between 1.5 and, and 0. Uh, it's unlikely that we get to 0 anytime soon, but it's very unlikely that we go to 2 or 3. Um, then you take the sequentials and you say, okay, the, the quarter over quarter number, Keith, however it had the fudgings in the number of 2.9%, that being higher only raises the probability that Q4, uh, really Q4 in particular, goes down sequentially versus that number, okay? So that's what you're asking and that, that's, that's, that's accurate. I think we're at zero, 0 0.5 on the sequential. Yep. So Q4 of 20, we're at equals 0.5%. So you know, forget James Comey and the FBI. What do you think Trump TV is going to be talking about after if, if he loses? You know, for the next three to six months after he loses, you know, he can't talk about the polls being wrong right now because it's the only thing that's keeping him alive. Is that the polls are starting to go in his favor? So you don't hear him saying that. But you're going to hear him talking about how the government data was actually lying to the population uh, with this kind of, it, it, effectively he's being accurate. If you're calling GDP 2 to 3 percent right now, you're lying to people. You absolutely are. Um, so you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be expletive about that. You don't have to be emotional about that. It's just a fact. Uh, as we go into the fourth quarter, the probability is very high that you get a, a, a significant sequential GDP slowdown. Yeah, absolutely. Do you mind if I uh, grab that marker and join you? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, which yeah. which uh, colors do you want? I'll take the blue. Okay. Looks pretty good. Seahawks color. So this is a very important modeling point. I don't know which camera we're looking at. This is a very important modeling point we want to make. This tells you all the information you need to know about the economic cycle. These are sequential data points like headline GDP or month over month auto sales that obfuscate what's actually going on underlying. The more you can take information from the blue line and add it to the forecast to the black line, the more you can increase your probability of being right on getting these bigger moves right, which is where all the money is made. Yep. There's trading opportunities in nailing these moves, but quite frankly, you'll confuse a lot of investors if all you did was focus on the blue line, which unfortunately for the fact of the matter, most investors tend to do that. <laughs> Certainly uh, most economists do. Um, so we want to be one step ahead of uh, investors and, one, and several steps ahead of most economists. So. Focus on the black line, take the information from the blue lines and, and, and add it to your forecast. That's all it That's is. That's a great point. So yeah. if you go, um, this is 2013. This right here, okay? That was very blue. That's why we have so much credibility. And at the end of 2012, this was happening. So this is 2012. Mm -hmm. This is the US GDP cycle, 2012. This was happening and we got that right. So there, literally, if, if you're subscribing to us then, you would have been shorting bonds, shorting gold, and buying growth stocks, okay? This plays out into the middle of last year with the latest cycles peaking further out into the year, which would include healthcare, financials, and consumer discretionary, which are now the three worst sectors in the S&P 500 because they were the last ones to go up, okay? So that, from, from, that, from that point, wherever you were in Q3 of 2015, if you started to risk manage your portfolio, uh, appropriately, like we told you to, August, you didn't get run over in August, for example, of 2015. You didn't buy the highs of November, December of 2015. You didn't do any of that because you basically were capitalizing on this part of the cycle, which is 2016. Okay? 2013 is not 2016. 
we wouldn't insult your intelligence by debating otherwise. But again, this big move and this big move is really what Darius and I are, are uniquely focused on. Uh, we'd say uniquely because we're the only firm, literally the only firm to get both of those moves right. And it's not, I'm not trying to brag about it. I'm just trying to teach you why. I'm trying to teach you why we've been accurate. I think it's important to study um, accurate and successful uh, business plans, coaching systems, risk management systems. And you know, fortunately, we've spent a lot of time and effort in our careers uh, to give you something that's better than the alternative. Uh, I'd say it's just good flat out, but it's, it's been a lot better than the alternative, which is macro funds shorting, uh, again, shorting the stock market here and buying, being long bonds. And, and, and here being long stocks and short bonds. I mean, it's, it's absurd uh, in terms of the, if, if you were, if they were an NFL team, if you took a composite index of the macro hedge funds that are in the Wall Street Journal article, uh, they would be the equivalent of the Cleveland Browns. I mean, they would be, they, they, there's be, there'd be no case to be made that anybody in the, the edifice of Cleveland uh, that is football should be getting paid. Yeah. Sure. And yeah, maybe someday the Browns will be good. And maybe someday, and I wrote that this morning, wait till the spring. You know, maybe someday uh, there will always be a day where I take the other side of our macro view. Uh, someday the Cleveland Browns will be good. And maybe that starts today. You know, maybe I just called the bottom. I don't know. But the reality is that it's obviously been a bad run for the Cleveland Browns. And it's been a really bad run for people who have been on the wrong side of our global macro rates call and our GIP growth inflation policy model. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just one last final point to make on this entire discussion, going back to the uh, chart we're drawing on the board. You know, internally, we spend all of our time modeling the black line, the black sine curve, the, the slower moving one that tends yep. to last for 12 to 24 months. This, yeah, this is the cycle. Yeah, that's the cycle. And those growth and inflation accelerations and decelerations that we're really trying to get right tend to last for 18 to 24 months at a time. We spend all of our time externally arguing about the blue line and how that's taking the data away from that right. longer term forecast. Um, so I like to think that at some point over the next few years, we'll start to really uh, get our audience to a level where they're really debating the black line as opposed to the fluctuations in the blue line. Yeah, then, they'll, then they won't be the people that miss that gold chart today, the three yeah. beautiful buying opportunities that you had in gold, or the seven buying opportunities we've shown that chart as well the seven going on eight buying opportunities you've had in long-term bonds in 17 months. You, know, you won't miss them because you'll totally understand why you're doing what you're doing. There's no more beautiful thing than having something that you believe in with 100% conviction. I believe 100 plus whatever you want to call the high conviction percent in my family, my friends, my firm, my process, okay? It's a good thing. You should, you should want to get yourself to that point instead of getting whipped around by all these different lures. You know, I could go off on what that means, but the reality is that I don't want to have another wife and another four kids. I am perfectly happy with 100% conviction that, that I'm in the right place and God put me there. Absolutely. All right, let's move on. Uh, we actually got a, uh, a question. It says, why don't we all just start talking about the black line and what to own? Newsflash, that's literally all we do every day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's literally exactly. it. That's the entire point of the GIP model and the asset allocation process born out of that. Or you could, or you could do the alternative, which is like, uh, and actually this guy's a good guy. Not, not that, you know, there's a lot of people that are good people. They're just not good at what they do. I mean, I wouldn't have my friends from Thunder Bay, you know, m m measure and map global, global macro risk management. Uh, but there's this good guy, Jeff DeGraff, who I used to use uh, or used to pay attention to when I was a younger analyst that uh, he was at ISI. He was the um, technician. Now he has a company called RenMac. You can look it up. But so they're tweeting this morning, the October surprise. The ISM number went to 51.9. The October surprise. Jeff, why don't you put the, the October surprise? The ADP number went down to 146. I mean, it's just like, there's so many data points you could cherry pick in here and miss the big black line. Like, I don't know if Jeff's got it right or wrong this year. I mean, it, it doesn't fundamentally concern me. All I'm trying to say is that if you're just talking about one-off data points, you're not really saying anything at all. Amen. All right, let's keep moving here. Uh, next question says, uh, Dee's asking, might you offer any insights on the bottom of the current drop in TLT? Uh, can, uh, in what? Uh, do, could you offer insights on the, what you think the bottom of the current drop in TLT might be? Uh, low end of the risk range. So 180, you're, you may have missed it last week if you didn't buy bonds uh, into the end of last week or yesterday. Uh, before bonds started, actually, as you note yesterday, bonds uh, started to do what they always do when the stock market starts going down at a faster rate, they outperform. So 
Uh, top end of the risk range is 188 on the 10 year bond yield if you want to use a proxy for the TLT is a 20 year duration. Uh, but I use the 10 year as a, as a proxy for most things uh, that are long term duration fixed income securities. Awesome. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's why we built the risk range, by the way. I mean, it's a really simple. It's not a simp, it's, it's not a simple calculation, uh, but it's an effective solution. OK, uh, and it's born out of a lot of experience, a lot of trial and error and frustration, frankly. Not that I would never be frank, but the reality is that, frankly, I don't like losing money and, and buying high and selling low. That's just not what I do. Uh, if you remember our buddy, uh, Dennis Garvin, uh, he said that, you know, one would get much uh, smaller in gold at 1240, 12, 1245. No, that's where one would get, one would have gotten a lot bigger in gold. Again, we don't sell low and chase high, okay? That's why we are so, <laughs> it's weird, but uh, we're actually considered very different than a lot of the prevailing kind of punditry out there. Because all they're really doing is chasing charts. Yeah, a lot of chart chasing. <laughs> All right, uh, speaking of gold, uh, says, how does gold break above its September 2011 highs without inflation? Deflation and a major market crash seem much more likely. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, to have some, something that looks like $1,900 gold, uh, you have to have the Fed on the war path like Bernanke was to devalue the dollar to a 40-year low. Uh, I'm perfectly happy with gold in this kind of 1300 to 1400 range. I'll be plenty happy bucking those gains if we own it from 1060. That's where it started the year. Uh, be up 30, 40 percent. I'm, I'm not looking for 10,000 gold. I don't agree with Rickards on that. Um, over time, you know, maybe maybe I would, but I think that uh, he and I will both be dead by the time gold's ever at that price. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Now everyone's like, oh, he doesn't agree with Rickards. Oh, my God. <laughs> Come on, get over yourself. I know. All right, Nick's asking, what, what will warn you of an increased chance of a U.S. equity crash in the near term? Would it be the VIX rising? Uh, what was the VIX the day before the last crash in 2000, 2007? Uh, VIX was, it's more about the regime of, yeah. of volatility. Once you break out above 30 on U.S. equity vol, the crash helmets, chin straps do them up. Like I say to my, like my hockey teams, you know, helmets on, chin straps on, guys. Uh, this is that anywhere, when you start to see the VIX pushing and pressing, uh, you're really punching the ball a, across the goal line of volatility of 30. You know, it's too late anyway on the way there. If you weren't short the market from 10 VIX to 30, you've already lost most of your money anyway if you're levered long, whatever that is, it did volatility from 10 to 30. Uh, but once you're above 30 and breaking out above 30, it's over. Kaput. Goodbye. Absolutely. Uh, and while we're just sticking with the VIX here, it says that with the dollar at the low end of the risk range, the VIX at the high end of the risk range and the SBX at the low end of its risk range, in addition to the notable decline in junk, do you think it's more probable that we break out to a new high in the VIX and stocks continue their decline? I don't know. Once you're at the top end of the risk range, the probable bet is that the VIX backs off the top end of the range. So, uh, you know, 1963 is the top end of the risk range. It, it tagged that number maybe a little higher yesterday and backed off. No, I, I would say that when, whenever, it doesn't matter what your research call is, really doesn't. I mean, that's the point, is that we have more research than you can shake a stick at in this black continuum and all the different data points within but when you're at the top end of the risk range, I don't really give a damn about my research. I mean, I, I make the, the decision, the cold hearted decision to book gains. If I'm short, whatever that is, it's at the low end of the range, book some at least. And then at the top end of the range, again, in this case, volatility, if I was long VIX options, I'd be selling some yesterday. Are you crazy? I mean, the things just went up. Well, you know, what did they went up 21% VIX last week, up, up to 19, 20 yesterday, you book some of that. So, Use, use the market's emotion as your backboard. We call it fading beta or fading the, fading the range. Absolutely. All right, uh, let's get a few more here before we wrap up. Uh, it says, uh, Steve doesn't understand Hedge Eye being short oil and natural resources, but also being long Brazil with so much of Brazil being natural resources. Uh, what is he missing? Yeah, we're not, well, you're missing that we're not short oil, um, <laughs> number one. Um, mm -hmm. I always like it when uh, people state a position that I have that I don't have. But the reality is that yesterday we added Brazil, uh, which is not a new add to the institutional community if you're an individual subscriber that would have been new to you, but probably not new to you if you're a macro show subscriber because we rank Brazil in the top three of our in, in, in international equity ideas. Um, so all we had it was a 4% down day to the low end of the range for EWZ. That's the main reason why we like it. We've liked it. Uh, and again, by the way, we've liked it. And oil has had a bullish bias, and that, that's, that's complementing it. It's not hurting it. I mean, the current risk range for oil, oil's at the low end of the risk range. The, the low end of the risk range is around 46. Top end of the risk range is 48, uh, 48 49. 
Um, so again, it's actually congruent with uh, the way you thought about it, because if you thought about it the way that the risk ranges are set up and how I'm looking at those risk ranges, and I did think Brazil was all about oil, which it's not, even if I did, I would still say buy it. I would have bought Brazil yesterday because both the EWZ and oil were tracking to the low end of the risk range. Absolutely. Does that make sense? Perfectly. Okay, good. Cool. All right, um, next question here from a, from a trend and tail perspective. From a trend and tail perspective, should this person be short Japan and Europe? And if so, does he hedge or not hedge each one's currency in a different manner? I don't, uh, I think the biggest gains on the European equity shorts and the Japanese equity shorts are probably rear view mirror right now. And the main reason why I believe that is because the dollar is really, you know, systematically starting to tell people who the boss is, you know. So uh, when the dollar's strong, the yen goes down, the euro goes down, European equity losses are less, as are Japanese equity losses. I'm not saying that these are markets that'd be levered long, but as you've noted in real-time alerts, I'm not short them currently. And in the daily trading range signal, which includes the Nikkei, the DAX, uh, things of that nature, the signal is, is neutral now. It's not bearish. Uh, that doesn't mean that the research is, is in bearish on Japanese growth and European growth, but the signal is neutral. And I think that that signal is picking up on the currency market's recent developments of a dollar really going back to flat uh, on a year-to-date basis. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, the juiciest market they've been short in the last, um, in the last couple months has been the U.S. stock market. I mean, I, I, I think that most people have missed that. But, that is an absolute um, fact. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, unless you're short Denmark, I mean... I doubt it. Good call. Awesome. All right, let's wrap up. Uh, two more, two more questions. It says, uh, could you explain how China can pull off a gentle deflation in the real estate market without blowing up the system, uh, or facing civil unrest? And do you assign a probability of, of that working? It strikes me him as a tight needle to thread. Yeah, I'll let you take the. Uh, the I like the words together: gentle deflation. <laughs> deflation. Uh, Ray Dalio, for those of you that don't know, when it comes to the debate about inflation or deflation, uh, or leverage versus deleveraging. Uh, he likes to use the words beautiful and ugly uh, because these things can be beautiful. In other words, they happen beautifully. There's a gentle deflation. That sounds like gentle, like how you called it gentle. It's all gentle, we can pet it, and it's nice, and it all ends perfectly for everyone at the same time. Then there's the ugly one, which tends to happen uh, more forcefully. Risk happens slowly, and then wham, all at once. I love the ugly. <laughs> it's more fun to talk about for sure. I rarely get hammered by the ugly. I know, that's I true. Like, I like the ugly because the ugly is measurable and mappable. Mm -hmm. So what do you think on China? China gentle? Nah, well, it's, uh, I, they are the biggest central planner in the world in terms of the amount yes. of people they centrally plan. Yes. Will it be gentle? No, in the context of the, the tightening measures they're implementing now are going to roll into the broader economy and slow economic growth further. So no, it won't be gentle in that case. Um, it will be gentle in this case that you're probably not going to see a tremendous bust across either the economy or the property market because they're very cognizant of, of, of de not destabilizing growth. Uh, but this is just you mean in is, like the reported numbers? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they make another, up. Yeah, exactly. That's another. That's another topic of discussion. But yeah, sticking with this one, China has a history of easing too much and then slamming on the brakes too hard. That's it's and and the the predominant reason for that is that they have a closed capital account and they have a tremendous amount of credit growth in the system that effectively just sloshes from one asset class to another. Um, if you recall that last year, we went out of real estate, the beginning of last year into property, into the stock market, came out of the stock market back into real estate. Now we have a real estate bubble. Um, you know, this is, this is very typical of China and they've really been on these sort of 12 to 18 month bubble cycles really throughout the last five to seven years as, as a lot of the credit as instead of perpetuating economic growth, it's really perpetuated uh, inflationary pressures either in the stock market, actual prices, or in the in the real estate market. So this is nothing new for China. Uh, we're just making the case that they're going to have to tighten, uh, or at the bare minimum, pull back on easing. Which, if you pull back on easing and roll into 2017, when you're lapping peak easing and peak stimulus on the fiscal fiscal side as well, you're not you're going to slow just regardless if you're slow easing. Slow property market. Yeah. You're going to slow broad economic growth yep. if you believe, which we detailed that. Economic growth in China has been a step function of government stimulus and, and, and credit issuance in the year to date. Um, so if you just take those things away, it's not like you have to tighten them. You just to stop doing them, you're going to slow. And if they actually start to tighten from here because they're unsuccessful in the most recent uh, macroprudential tightening um, in the property market, if they have to actually incrementally tighten from here, it's going to slow growth even that much further. So that's been our call in China for the last month or so, and we expect that to be the case ongoing. Crystal clear. Awesome. And then uh, lastly, George is asking, 
market-based inflation expectations continue to go up as proxy by five-year break-evens. What is driving this, and do you think it is sustainable? Well, I mean, what are they up to, George? Like 1.6% on the five-year break-even? That's, I mean, it doesn't, all, by the way, inflation expectations, inflation itself is a lagging indicator. You know that, right? So at the end of this cycle, inflation, wage inflation in particular, goes up at the very end of the cycle. So you're getting these wage inflations and uh, break-even ex uh, inflation expectations that are just off the cycle lows of deflation, which was last year, uh, to something inside of two percent. If the Federal Reserve raises rates on that, you know it'll just blow things. It'll just deflate all those inflation expectations faster. You look. I'd, I'd challenge you to look back not too long ago, the first quarter, what inflation expectations did on that very same break-even metric. They got hammered. Um, so again, at this juncture, it's just kind of like a passive aggressive inflation curve that's rising. Um, if I could draw that uh, here, and instead of, you know, this is GDP. This is, if we just do the same sign curve, the cycle of inflation, which really uh, put in its lows like in 2015. So instead of 2016 here, you'd have deflation 2015. That was all in there. This has been the story of inflation this year. It pops up probably stops around 2%, sucks everybody in who thinks inflation expectations are gonna go bonkers. The one thing that could change that is if the dollar got devalued like significantly. Not, the dollar's not doing that, it's actually going up. So um, this is what you got. You, came, you cycled against the base effects of that um, bombed out low where inflation was zero. And you're in a sine curve really of inflation that peaked in 20, uh, I think this was 3.8%, 4% inflation in 2011, 2011, 2012 yeah. cycle? 2011. Uh, 2011. So that's when the dollar was at a 40-year low. Inflation in dollars was at a 40-year high. Uh, not 40-year high, but, you know, uh, and it's cycle high because they change this number all the time. It was so, an all-time high, if you believe, the commodity market. Right. If you, all time, <laughs> a CRB index hit an all-time high that year, okay? Gold hit an all-time high that year. It was 3.8%. So if that's the high, and in your sine curve, 0% is the low, or minus one is the low, all you're doing is bouncing back to like halfway back up that curve. That's it. And if you get Fed rate hikes on that, the number one catalyst to deflate this line from here back down to over here mm -hmm. would be rate hikes. Yeah. So the inflation expectations across the developed world did get too bombed out in the beginning of this year. Um, especially considering that basically every major economy in the in the world is in quad three, um, with inflation accelerating okay. to to a lower high, a lower all time high. Um, so what we've seen in the last few months, you know, if you think about five year five year four break even rates, really across everywhere are up somewhere between twenty and fifty basis points. But they're up to you know levels that are one four to one six one seven. Uh, pick your developed country. That's that's effectively what we're saying. That's it. You know, we're not going back to 3.8% inflation or, or, heaven forbid, you know, 6% inflation, which is what we saw in 2008. Um, we're just making the case that inflation is accelerating to a lower all-time high. Uh, but beyond that, just taking a step back, inflation is a late cycle yeah. phenomenon. And if you think about wage inflation, which typically peaks somewhere between four, three to f six months ahead of a recession, um, obviously reported inflation, if you look at the last recessions or the last real major slowdown, which is 2011, inflation peaked then because what does inflation do? It takes a bite out of consumption growth and consumption is the, you know, the overwhelming dominant driver of, of, of U.S. economic growth um, at 70 percent of the number. So that, that tends to be the case. So if you believe that inflation is accelerating to this lower high, which we believe, uh, what does that do for your growth forecast on the margin that should take down your real GDP growth forecast, which we've shown in our back test data that uh, long term interest rates are, are, are cycling with. Mm -hmm. Uh, Josephine, if you show slide 12, maybe a, a good lesson on this. And it's not just, you know, when you start making the case for uh, global inflation versus U.S. inflation, those are not uh, the same thing. So you can see, this is just the data. This is me, exactly what I just showed you, which is coming out of 2015, you know, things got smashed. You see the CPI revision trend for G7 plus China just got smashed to the lows. First quarter of 2016 starts to bounce, world CPI bounces, everybody's going dovish. You get the bounce, but this is that's all it is. It's a bounce off the defla you know, again the deflation of the inflation. You get a reflation, and then the reflation starts to come off its top again. It looks almost identical to an oil chart. I mean, if you look at oil, you know, real inflation was 110. That's where Bernanke said, "Oh, no, no, no inflation." Most of the Bernanke drones running around, you know, like chickens with their heads cut off, saying they're going to short bonds on inflation fears. 
Uh, they didn't. They didn't have any of those concerns because they're shorting uh, their 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 long, their long bonds in 2013 with oil at 100. I mean, it, 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 these kinds of things that people do. Uh, it's it's totally incongruent. Whereas if you study our process, it's completely congruent. Uh, C squared, completely congruent. Does that does that make sense? Yes. Completely to me it does. and utterly. C U C, completely and utterly congruent. I challenge you, and you should challenge anyone you're paying. Yeah, damn it, they, they, if you're paying them, they better be consistent. Find the congruent nature of their process. And if it just changes like randomly all the time, I mean, it's not a process. You're paying for a lot. <laughs> well, some people are very complicit and willing to pay for reasons why the stock market would never go down. Just an <laughs> ever-changing list right, of right. A really thoughtful frequentist probability statistics that suggest why you should always be permanently long of equities. But uh, you can get that now for free, provided that you value CNBC on your cable bill at a very low. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that's what yeah. that is. It's permeable marketing. I mean, yeah. it's, not, it's not useful. It's not how people have made money this year. No, not, not at all. All right, we'll wrap it up there. Uh, we're running along, but uh, we appreciate you guys taking the time to join us this morning. Uh, hopefully this was educational and entertaining as well. Catch you here next time. Have a good one out there.